Hi, Gabon. Hello, Frank. Um, it's uh, it's really a pleasure and um, and an honor for me to to have you on today. Um, unfortunately, it's for all the the wrong reasons. But um, the last year has been for I think many many of us so traumatic, uh, often paralyzing. Uh, that I thought talking to you, who's um, an expert on these questions, trauma and addiction, and um, was was very important. I, I'm not going to ask you to to find solutions for all of us, but um, I mean, in a way, I've been trying through these videos. Um, it's been for me a way to um, to try to deal with what's happening and what's been happening in, in Gaza, in Palestine, and now in Lebanon for, for the last year, uh, talking to friends and, and, and others. Um, millions of people woke up this morning to images on their phones, on their TVs, uh, probably not on their TVs actually, but on their phones anyway, of, um, of people burned alive in yeah. northern Gaza. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, um, as if the trauma we've been experiencing for a year wasn't enough, and um, many of us maybe naively thought that the level of horror had reached a point where we already can cannot find words to describe, but this morning went a, n a notch above what we thought was possible. Uh, these kind of images can have um, a very paralyzing effect on people. But you have spoken specifically on guilt and the way guilt is in a way necessary to feel our interconnectedness with others. Um, but how can we turn, I mean, people who live like me in Europe, um, my friends in the US uh, who are living in countries where governments have been actively complicit in this genocide um, can often feel really paralyzed. So how, how can we turn this guilt into something in a way positive that will benefit the people suffering in Gaza, Palestine, um, and Lebanon? Well, first of all, this morning's images, it's, it's like we're watching Auschwitz on TikTok, you know, had there been YouTube and um, Instagram and TikTok around Auschwitz, this is what we would have seen, people burning alive. And um, it's it's beyond horrendous. It's beyond comprehension. And, and as to your statement about you thought that it would end at some point, in, actually it's the other way around. When people like this are empowered and encouraged and allowed and supported and perpetrating their horrors, they get more crazy. They get more cruel. They get more remorseless, more relentless, uh, more ruthless. That's what happened to the Nazis. The Nazis did not start off with uh, gas chambers, you know, but then they started killing their their mentally ill people in gas vans. Then they started shooting Jews in Eastern Europe, and then they ended up with the gas chambers of Auschwitz. So it's, it's, it's a it, it's a progression of madness and cruelty. That's almost inevitable on the part of the perpetrator. And especially when it's encouraged by all the imperial powers. Now you ask about guilt in Brussels. Well, there's not been enough guilt in Brussels. The Belgians killed 12 million Congolese in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. That subject is barely talked about in, in Brussels even today. I don't know how much education of that Holocaust is um, is uh, conducted in Belgian schools. Maybe you can tell me, but how much time is spent educating Belgian kids about what their country did? You tell me. What's the answer? I've got a thirteen years old kid. He hasn't. Yeah. He doesn't know a word about what's happened in, in Congo so far. Yeah. 12, I think it was 12. I mean, not, not, not through school, not through school anyway. Yeah. So that if people don't look at their own history, 
why would they look at horrors elsewhere? So that in the West, there's been this denial. You know, if you walk through Trafalgar Square or Westminster Abbey in London, you see all these monuments to these mass murderers who killed thousands and tens of thousands of people in India, in Africa, and elsewhere in Asia. You know, um, so th th the present horrors fit into a long history of Western colonialism and Western mass murder of indigenous people. So what do you do with the guilt? Well, there's a guilt with, you know, guilt. Guilt is when you do something <clears throat> deliberately that you could have avoided doing. I don't feel guilt about what Israel is doing. I'm not doing it. I'm against it. I've been against it for decades. When I used to believe in it, before 1967, I didn't know any better. It's just what I believed. You know, as a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust, why would I not believe in a Jewish state? You know? I don't feel guilty about that. And since I've been opposing it for decades now, why would I feel guilty about that? So it's not a question of guilt. It's a question of rage. It's a question of outrage. And, and and the problem is that the outrage is helpless because your government and my government here in Canada and all the Western governments, all the post-colonial legacy governments are supporting this current ethnic cleansing and colonial perpetration. So the proper response is not guilt. The proper response is how can we channel our rage? and healthy rage. And I'm afraid that's where we run into trouble because apart from providing support, whatever material support we can give to the Palestinians, apart from providing moral support, apart from speaking the truth, we also have to accept that we're helpless in the sense that all the conversations that you've had with the wonderful people that you've had on your program, Ilan Papi and others, all the talks that I've been giving, they've not saved a single life of a single Palestinian infant. And in the short term, they're not going to. And so the question is, do we stay silent, or can we continue to talk, make a contribution, hopefully, to wake people up in the long term? And I think one thing we can say is that more and more people are waking up. And more and more people are seeing reality, and more and more people are recognizing the horror of the Zionist project that it has perpetrated on the Palestinian people, and perpetrates on the world, actually. And how that Zionist project is bound up with the international colonial system, imperial system. So our job, can we keep, we, can we stay awake? Can we hold on to ourselves? Can we hold on to a faith in humanity? Can we make a contribution that in the long term may make a difference? That's my response. And you know what? In the meanwhile, our hearts are breaking every day. Our hearts are breaking every day, and there's nothing we can do about that. In your, Gabo, in, in your opinion, was is what we are experiencing this this genocide and sometimes sometimes i think the word genocide is actually too soft we should find another word because there's um there's the intent there is the action but there's this like kind of added sad, 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 sadism i feel to you know they they you know people in Ga northern gaza cannot even flee and they are being you know burned alive and um but do you, do you think, in a way, that this, the Zionism project and Zionism always had this possibility, you know, in itself? Well, it didn't start off to be sadist. It didn't start off like that. Uh, it started off with this genuine desire to create a Jewish state <clears throat> for the persecuted Jews of Eastern Europe. Um, the problem was, the essential contradiction was, 
that, as we all know, there was a people already living there. And there's no way that the Zionist project could have been realized. And they, and they knew this right from the beginning without support of the imperial powers. So Theodor Herzl, the founder of Zion, Hungarian Jew like me, um, the founder of uh, modern political Zionism, he tried to make deals with all the imperial powers. He went to the Turks, he went to the Russians, he went to the, there was this highly anti-Semitic Russian leader, Count Pleve, who supported the pogroms. But, but Herzl went to deal with him trying to get imperial support for this Jewish project in Palestine. Of course, <clears throat> he ended up on the right side of history, not he because he was no longer alive, but the movement in that the British Empire took up the cause of Zionism because as Winston Churchill said, the establishment of a Jewish entity in Palestine accords with the best interests of the British Empire. So there's no other way that the Zionist project could have succeeded to establish itself in Palestine with the support of foreign imperialism. And that's what it's done ever since. So that means you have to, you have to tread on the rights and the hopes and the um, national existence of the indigenous people. And so it's not that they set out to be cruel, it's that they had to become cruel in order to achieve their goals. And that's not retrospective. Some of them saw that right from the beginning. There was a, a Jewish leader, Asher Ginsberg, his Hebrew name was Ahad Am. He said in 1896 that if we could, 1896, that if we continue to treat the Arabs like this, all we're going to end up is one small Levantine people tormenting another small Levantine people. And he said, if this is the Messiah coming, I don't want to see him arrive. So it's not that this is retrospective. There were Jews all along who saw that in order to create the Jewish state, they had to oppress and, 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 and suppress the Palestinians. Most of the Zionist leaders said, yeah, we have to do that, but we're going to do it because our interests are more dire and more important. So that it's not that they set out to be cruel, it's that they had to become cruel, they had to harden their hearts in order to establish their project. And they did. And very quickly, they became very uh, cynical, very hypocritical, very cruel towards the Palestinians, suppressing them, using the British alliance to um, defeat Palestinian opposition to the takeover of their homeland. The British Empire sent 150,000 troops to Palestine in 1936 to suppress the Arab revolt. The Jews enthusiastically took part in that suppression. And then the Jewish terrorist organizations began killing Palestinian civilians and others. And then since then, the commitment to ethnic cleansing and to the enlargement of the Jewish state has necessitated increasing cruelty. So some of the early Zionists and some of the older Zionists even now can't believe what they're seeing. How the state has become this fascistic, suppressive, cruel, sadistic entity. But it's an internal logic that if I, once I decide to start suppressing somebody, I'm going to have to keep getting harder and tougher and more cruel in the process. So it was an internal logic. They didn't, they didn't set out that way, but inevitably they had to become that way. And when they made the commitment after 67 to hold on to the occupied territories, that just magnified. And, and, and you, you said it. Oh, one, sorry. One final comment on the statism. All you have to do is to watch the TikTok videos of Israeli soldiers dancing and laughing and chortling and dressing themselves in the clothes of Palestinians and mocking the Palestinians and, 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 and making humor out of blowing up homes. I mean, it's sadism of the worst sort. And they don't even hide it. They put it on TikTok. The Western press doesn't, uh, doesn't um, reproduce these images, but anybody can watch them. They become sadists. Actually, I didn't want to ask you this question, but 
now that you've mentioned the TikTok videos of Israeli soldiers dancing and you know while blowing up houses in Gaza, yeah, I, I, I'm very interested in trying to understand how can can a, a person, and I don't think you, we are born with a bad gene or a good gene, how yeah. a, per, a person can reach this level of sadism. We know that Israeli kids, Israeli Jews, are brainwashed from a very, very early age through school books and through education to believe that, um, you know, everyone wants them dead and that they are surrounded by, by monsters. Um, but, but, but do they, do they, tr they truly believe it, don't they? Well, if you listen, listen, to, listen to people like Nurit Palad, who is the daughter of Miha Palad, who is an idea general, or her brother Miko Palad, if you listen to Ilan Pape, um, <clears throat> who grew up in Israel and was in the idea, if you listen to Shlomo Sand, um, all these other Israelis, they'll tell you about the propaganda and the brainwashing that happens almost right from birth. So that the sense of superiority and entitlement and fear and loathing of the Arabs is just brainwashed into them right from the beginning. It's like a cult. And, um, and it works. And it, and it works really beautifully. And uh, then, of course, Palestinian resistance doesn't always take, always take beautiful forms. I mean, the Palestinians have done some terrible things. You know, the suicide bombings, the killing of civilians. Now, why people are driven to that despair, that's another question. But from the Israeli point of view, this just validates and justifies what they've, what they've always been taught. You know, and uh, October the 7th, the killings of civilians, the abduction of people and all that, to the Israelis, this just justifies everything they've ever been told about the Palestinians. And what they did to create the Palestinians, they never they didn't consider that for a second. But I also think it's traumatizing to grow up in an environment like that. It's traumatizing to grow up in an environment where you're always told that you're always under threat. And that fear and loathing of the other is, is like the essential value. It's traumatizing to grow up like that. What does that do to you as a person? You know, um, not to mention, there's a lot of historical trauma in the parents and the parents of the parents of Israelis that they brought from Europe. And those traumatic imprints are passed on as well, quite apart from the Palestinian-Israeli struggle. There's just trauma that's passed on from generations. So you get this um, historical brainwashing and this um, immersion into a cult-like sense of superiority and loathing of the other coupled with historical trauma passed on from generations, and you get people capable of doing what they're doing now. And then you get the valorization. You know what I mean? Most of the Israeli press, as you know, if you read Haaretz or listen to Gideon Levy or any of these honest Israelis, um, the Israeli press just valorizes the Israeli army, the most moral army in the world. Here they're perpetrating mass murder and war crimes, and they still think they're the most moral army in the world. And the heroism. What heroism? Dropping bombs on civilians from the air who have no defenses, who have no anti-tank weapons, who have no uh, capacity to fight back in any meaningful sense. And this is valorized as heroism. I mean, it's just... You know, you know what, Frank? One runs out of words. Is what happens? Yeah. At a certain point, words just become inadequate in the face of what we're watching, and I think that's part of the problem a lot of us have. We don't even know how to even talk about it anymore. Yeah, and and that's what I, in a way, wanted to ask you because, like, what does it do to your mind when you have no words? 
to describe what you are saying. That's something I've, I'm experiencing myself, like I'm sure millions of others, yeah. where I cannot find words and I have this feeling of utter uselessness. Um, what, what can it create, in a way, in, in the mind, this feeling of there's no words to describe what we are seeing? Well, first of all, I would argue with you that uselessness is not a feeling. It's uh, feelings that I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm sad, I'm angry. Uselessness is a self-judgment. It's a point of view. And it's not a very compassionate one either. Because nobody is useless. And um, <clears throat> But as to your core question about how to handle these emotions for which the words are inadequate, you just allow yourself to feel them. Be with them. Just really be with them. Be with them. And know that you're not alone. I mean, I've just been through a, I just had a tour in Europe, a six country, three week tour in Europe. I didn't make it to Belgium, but I was in Holland, Denmark, and England, Eastern Europe. Um, and I can tell you, I met people everywhere who have the same feeling. Not the majority, perhaps. The majority have a way of distancing themselves from reality, and they, they care more about which football team wins the next game than what's ha happening in some other part of the world. But everywhere I met, there were people whose hearts were broken. And it's good to be in touch with other people whose hearts are broken. Let our hearts be broken together. But beyond that, let's just feel what we feel. Don't try and push it down. How have, um, how have you dealt with it? I, remember, I watched an interview you gave about four months ago, I think to TRT, where you said that this time had been the heaviest and darkest time of your life for sure. This was four months ago. Um, still like how do you relate? Yeah, yeah, it's still like that. I mean, apart from my experience as an infant in the Second World War, when Budapest was being bombed by the Allies and occupied by the Germans, and there's all this horror was taking place to my family and to others, which I don't recall consciously. The emotional memories are stamped in my nervous system, but in, in my conscious memory. <clears throat> Look, I lived through the Vietnam War, and the Americans, as you know, killed two to three million Vietnamese in the most horrible ways, napalm and bomb them and mass murder and so on. But at least the Vietnamese had the capacity to fight back. They had the weapons from China and, 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 and Russia. They had anti-aircraft guns. They could shoot down airplanes. They had the army and the guerrilla experience that they gained fighting against the French. And they were an effective resistance force that ultimately was able to defeat the Americans. So horrible as that was, it wasn't as one-sided as this is. It's the utter one-sidedness of what we're watching. And furthermore, the development of technology where it's not just a few minutes on the nightly news. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on Instagram, you know, TikTok. And so just the palpable presence of this horror on our screens. All I have to do is pick this up and I can see people being burning alive this morning. So... First of all, the availability of it, and secondly, the utter one-sidedness of it. The utter one-sidedness of it. And then, the complete hypocrisy and dishonesty of the Western media. 
so that you think you're going crazy. Like this, you see in front of your eyes, you see what's happening. Your heart tells you how wrong this is. And there's all these people telling you that this is justified. So the disconnect is just immense. So how do people even hold on to their moral sense? How do they hold on to themselves? You know, how do they hold on to their awareness of what is right and wrong and, 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 and their commitment to the truth? It's a real challenge. What about the fact that Israel says it's, it's doing it in your name, in your name, in, in the name of the Jewish people or in the name of Jews or for the Jews? Yeah, well, I can only laugh. Uh, first of all, if they're naming it in, in the name of the Jews, if they're doing it in the name of the Jews, uh, that automatically makes the whole world anti-Semitic because a lot of the world hates what's happening. Maybe not the leaders, but billions of people in the world are totally appalled. Do you really want people to be against the Jews? Then keep claiming that you're naming, doing this in the name of the Jews. So, I mean, it's just absurd, you know. Secondly, it's never been true. It's never been true. Zionism was never the... 100% consensus ideology amongst Jews. People right from the beginning opposed Zionism for all kinds of reasons. Some for religious reasons, some for political reasons, some because they saw what it would do to the Palestinians, some because they saw what it would do to the Jewish soul, how it would corrupt the Jewish soul, how it would make us into oppressors. Now the fact that right now Zionism amongst Western Jews is the majority ideology, so what? That's a temporary phenomena. So it's just an absurdity. And, and they're not even doing it in the name of all the Israelis. What about the Israelis who are opposed to what's going on? A few, but still, in Jewish tradition, you know, there's a wonderful dynamic and uh, where there are truth-tellers who say to the rulers and the people, what you're doing is wrong. It goes against the laws of, 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 of divine truth. And those people are called the prophets. And the prophets are always telling the people and the, and the rulers, no, what you're doing is morally indefensible. So I honor that tradition in Judaism, where truth-telling in the face of power and in the face of nationalism is considered to be a higher value. So it's just ridiculous. I don't even take it seriously, this thing that they're doing it in my name. You know, I used to. But no, it, it, it's so absurd and it's so untrue, it's barely even worth responding to. Do you, do you think Zionism is temporary? I think, personally, I think, I've thought this for many years now, I think Zionism will be looked upon by Jewish history as one of the greatest disasters in Jewish history. Um, <clears throat> here's the thing. The only reason, like what is Israel? It's a small little country with 7 million Jews. What do you think gives it its power to dominate the Middle East? The United States the imperial powers, first Britain and France, and then now the United States. Now, you can make three assumptions about why the United States supports Israel. One of them is America, the American empire, loves the Jews. Well, good luck with that one. Empires don't love anybody. They just, you know, and there's no reason to think they love the Jews, you know? So that's nonsense. Secondly, the Jews control the United States. Well, it may sometimes look like it when it comes to foreign policy, but it's not true. You know, the, the ruling corporations and economic mega-giants who really control American politics are not Jewish. 
Now, there's a powerful Jewish lobby that contributes to it, but it's not in charge. There used to be a powerful China lobby until the United States decided to recognize China, and then the China lobby evaporated like that. So, America, the American empire doesn't love the Jews or anybody. Secondly, the Jews don't control the United States, control the United States. That leaves a third reason, that it's in the interests of the American empire to support Israel. Which it is. You know, Joe Biden says, if we didn't have Israel, we'd have to create it. They consider it an unsinkable aircraft carrier, a little military bulldog that can dominate and intimidate the Arab Middle East. And it's worked really well that way. But there's two problems. One is empires change. If you want to know what happens to the clients of the American empire when the American empire decides not to participate anymore, then look at what happened to the generals in Vietnam. Or look at what happens to any number of Latin American petty little dictators. So it may not be forever that America declares its interest to lie with Israel. But there's an even more powerful point. Empires don't last forever. Like the Roman Empire lasted a thousand years or more. The British Empire lasted a few hundred years. The American Empire, which came into its most um, powerful position at the end of the Second World War, and after the fall of the Soviet Union, seemed like it was not a dominant, permanently dominant entity in the world. It's already in decline. It hasn't won a war for a long time. It's, it's caused a lot of damage, but it had to get the hell out of Iraq. It had to get the hell out of Afghanistan. It was defeated in Vietnam. And economically, it's losing its power to, to China, to India, you know. So it's waning. This empire will not last forever. And Hannah Arendt, the great Jewish philosopher, said in 1942, that it's a mistake on the part of the Zionists to tie their interests to the interests of foreign powers far away while alienating the local population. Well, it wasn't a mistake. It's the only way they could have done it. But that's what they've done. What's going to happen to this little country when the American empire, for whatever reason, is no longer there to, to buttress it up, to, to, to fill it with weapons, to flood it with wealth to support it diplomatically. So the Zionism is going to be seen as a blip in Jewish history, and there are the zealots who in 70 AD led the revolt against the Romans and civil war amongst the Jews ended up in total disaster. Zionism will be seen, in my view, as that kind of disaster in Jewish history, and it will be seen that way by Jews. It might take 100 years, 200 years, I don't know. But it will be seen like that. I want to end with, in a way, kind of two questions into one, going back to trauma. We often, at least when it comes to Palestine, only men mention numbers. Yeah. You know, 42,000 killed, 100 and 200,000 injured, I remember in 2008, 2009, after um, Operation Cass led the uh, Lancet, the, you know, with the British Medical Journal, yeah. um, had a report uh, saying that in Gaza, 60% of the children in Gaza, and we know Gaza is about 50% children of children. Yeah. So 60% of the children in Gaza had lost the will to live. Operation Cast Lead was about three weeks and killed about 1,300, 1,400 Palestinians. Yeah. What kind of scars can this bloody and sadistic genocide can leave on the children of Palestine? And also, and that would be in a way my last question, are you worried that Gaza, in the eyes of other authoritarian regimes and dictatorships and I'm, I'm including what so-called democracies could become the new normal. Well, as to the first question, <clears throat> in 2000 and f 
before before Hamas became the ruling party in Gaza, there was a psychiatric report on the post-traumatic state of Palestinian children. 95% of them showed post-traumatic symptoms of one kind or another. And get, by the way, <clears throat> in, in 2004, those kids were children. Guess who were the young people that streamed into Israel on, on October the 7th? Those traumatized kids full of despair and rage. Nobody ever talks about that. And <clears throat> that was before the current horrors. At this point, I have to tell you, I'm not confident that Gaza will even survive as an entity. I'm not confident that the Israelis won't succeed in somehow forcing them into even a small enclave. And, and in a smaller concentration camp. Israel at this point seems to have the winning hand in terms of militarily. I have terrible forebodings about what's going to happen to the Palestinians. Um, but we'll see. They also have tremendous resilience, tremendous courage. I've, I've visited Gaza. I've been to the occupied territories. <clears throat> I know how much heart they have. I have some faith in them, but history is very, very cruel sometimes. I don't know how it's going to go. I've forgotten the second part of your question, Frank. No, I was wondering if, if Gaza could become the new I'll, normal. You know, Israel did it. <clears throat> Why not? Yeah. I think that Gaza, <clears throat> and I think of <clears throat> wider support for Israel, we live in a post-colonial world where a very few powers and economic entities control most of the world, and the inequality, as you know, is just getting worse and worse, and so that the top few people in the world control more wealth than the bottom half, 50% of humanity. That system has to be maintained. And one of the reasons I think that the West supports Israel so vociferously is because it's a lesson to the rest of the world. You better not challenge us. If you want to know what's going to happen to you, this is what's going to happen to you. So um, it already has become the new normal. And, um, you know, there's an article in the New York Times this morning how about the Israelis are using Palestinians as human shields? There's an article in Le Monde this morning about how the Bedouin have been ethnically cleansed from the Negev Desert and from the West Bank. These things are reported, but nobody does anything about them. So this is the, this is the new normal. Until a sufficient percentage of human, humanity stands up and says no, we will not accept this new normal. So that's why you and I keep talking, and we'll keep talking as long as there's breath in our lungs, you know. And um, perhaps we're contributing. Yeah. To perhaps we're contributing to something in the long term, and at least perhaps in the present, we are saying to Palestinians, "There's not much we can do to help you practically, but at least we see you, and you're not alone." And I think that's important. Thank you, Gabor. I, I cannot tell you how much I um, appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me. So um, many thanks, really. My pleasure. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. <laughs>